Good evening. I'm Steve Bloomfield. I'm Associate Director of the Watson Institute. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, this lecture is an introduction to a larger conference. Most all of you know that there is a larger conference taking place all day tomorrow and on Saturday. But we thought to inaugurate our conversations with Ambassador Quainton. And so after I give a few words of welcome, which have a sheet of translation, una hoja fuera, que tiene una traducción de lo que voy a decir ahora, I will then uh, hand the floor over to Stephen Kinzer to introduce Ambassador Quainton. To plan a conference to commemorate an event that took place many years ago is to be able to anticipate much what to discuss and whom to invite and how to respect one's visitors as fully as possible. It was indeed fully two years ago when I approached Stephen Kinzer, a senior fellow here at the Watson Institute and a dearly valued colleague, who I knew to have had great experience covering the wars in all of Central America and specifically in Nicaragua. When he was a somewhat younger journalist with the Boston Globe, to see if we might design a strategy toward organizing a conference to think anew about the revolution nearly now 40 years later. Soon after that initial conversation, Stephen identified Matteo Hartkin, a young scholar at Harvard studying the revolution, who as it happened not only knew the history and the politics, but also many of the essential actors. Uh, if we can offer a round of applause for Matteo, because he is newly a doctorate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Matteo is working on this conference simultaneous to defending his dissertation, and it's all happened concurrently. There have been times when I've thought, Matteo being so connected to friends in Nicaragua, that this is not much more for him than a family reunion but uh, I'm glad to be able to accumulate together the family. We began to discuss in earnest the prospect of this conference when Rich Snyder, a scholar of Latin American comparative politics at Brown also joined our effort. As it turned out, and I hope all of us will see, ours has been a dream of efficiency, insight, relationships, and scholarship. And we particularly thank, at the moment, our colleague Christy Kilgis, who has brought our inspirations down to earth and firmly to this place. I think Christy might be outside still organizing, but she's the author of all the communications and the fact that you miraculously have come together in this place. So I want to particularly thank her, and we'll have a chance to thank her again later. Thank you all for journeying both in space and in time in order to come together in this place. Along the way of our planning, unanticipated events have occurred. After all, we started talking quite a while ago. All of us know, and many of you have experienced directly yourselves in Nicaragua, renewed civil strife, political and social pressures culminating in violence, in death, in repression, and in great geographical dislocation. We had wanted to plan, in fact, two conferences, one here in Providence, and the other that was meant to take place just a few days after in Managua. And of course, that became impossible to plan because of the situation there now. My own reminiscence is innocent enough. In July and August and September of 1978, I was a 23-year-old trainee in the US Peace Corps in La Guasima de Alajuela in Costa Rica, soon to be headed for two years of Peace Corps service in Ecuador. As my weeks in training wore on in the distance at night, one could hear jet engines revving at the Aeropuerto San, San, Juan Santa Maria, 
The idea being that the potential eruption of violence across the border in Nicaragua might compromise Costa Rica's secure democracy. Or perhaps it was something thicker than that. In any case, a maelstrom was gathering, and no one knew quite what would come next. Our idea from this chart has been to come together to expose known truths, to debate unresolved and likely unresolvable puzzles, to bring together people from various sides of issues still so salient, questions of minority rights, of gender, of militarism and democracy, of great powers and small powers, of poverty and wealth, of authoritarianism, and of liberation, and of the ways in which minds bend and excuse me, minds bend around and sometimes even distort lived and slowly receding realities, willfully or not, and perhaps also in simple human ways to recall and to reminisce. So I give you Stephen Kinzer, who will make an introduction of Ambassador Quainton, and we'll get this conference begun. Thank you. Well, like many of you, I never imagined that I'd be standing here 40 years later. Um, this, uh, this story uh, touches on so many great questions. Uh, I ask myself, as I look at what's happening now to our beloved Maldito Pais, was this inevitable? So did the Sandinista revolution of uh, the late 1970s and what happened in the 1980s make it inevitable? that we would have an authoritarian regime decades later? Is that what revolution produces? Or was it on the right track but was pushed off one way or another? Um, I'm very interested to hear your perspectives on this. Well, what, because it uh, is a question that goes well beyond Nicaragua. How do you begin political processes that will be dramatic enough to make substantial changes in the lives of many ordinary people without setting in motion a process which in the end is ultimately going to produce some kind of catastrophe or authoritarianism? I'm not sure the world has quite figured out an answer to that question yet, but I'll look forward to our discussion and I hope to uh, enrich my own uh, perspectives on that very deep question. Uh, now, uh, during the years I spent in Nicaragua, like every journalist, I always placed a special premium on those officials that would answer the phone calls of a journalist. And that wasn't so many. Uh, I quickly developed my list of the people that I actually could pick up and uh, pick up a phone and call. Uh, Alejandro Bendaño was one of them. He used to say, uh, con el habla, when I would call. So that was great. Uh, and another one of them was Ambassador Quainton. Uh, during the 1980s, the United States was very fortunate to have two brilliant uh, Foreign Service officers, uh, Anthony Quentin and uh, Harry Burgold, as our ambassadors in Nicaragua. Uh, and uh, both of them, I think, uh, in some ways went through the same process and came to the same place and paid the same price. So Ambassador Quentin was serving from 1982 to 1984. I just want to try to... Uh, place that moment in the historical perspective of Nicaragua now. So 1981 was the year when Tom Enders came down to Nicaragua and offered a deal to the Sandinistas, which essentially was, if you stop sending any aid to El Salvador and don't help any other revolutionary groups in Central America, we're going to leave you alone. Um, so he brought this offer down, and as he later explained, the commandantes began giving him a long lecture about Nicaraguan history that started with Zelaya or Walker, and they went through Sandino, and he just told them, please be quiet and just answer me. And the answer was no. The Sandinistas were not prepared to do that. And when I later asked one of the commandantes, Bayero Arce, why didn't you say yes to Enders? He said to me, we analyzed the proposal, and we thought that this was what they had in mind. The Americans have the idea Get the Sandinistas to stop helping all the other revolutions in the neighborhood so we can crush them. And then once the Sandinistas are alone and have no friends, then we come in and get them. So we thought, we're too smart for this. We're not falling for that. So that had happened just recently uh, when uh, Ambassador Quainton arrived. 
he arrived almost exactly at the moment when the Contra War began, because that war began with the blowing up of bridges in northern Nicaragua uh, in March of 1982, which was exactly when Ambassador Clayton arrived. So he was there at the moment when the whole thing began. Um, he, Ambassador Quayton was also there when the Sandinistas imposed their military draft, which caused great controversy. He was there when uh, the Pope came and had his confrontation with uh, Father Cardinal. Um, and uh, I think the uh, salient aspect of Ambassador Quayton's tenure, and also the salient aspect of his successor's tenure, was that as professional diplomats, they were looking for diplomatic solutions. They were trying to work in their profession, which is diplomacy. And that was, uh, that was what brought both of them to the ends of their careers. Uh, in international relations, we like to think that military pressure is used to help obtain a political result. So you want to have a diplomatic process going at the same time. But this was not the policy in Washington at that time. Uh, this was a period when one of Ronald Reagan's aides referred to uh, the Sandinista government as an infected piece of meat. And when a US ambassador in Central America compared the Sandinista front to the Nazis. So that was the perception uh, in Washington. And that was not going to work with anybody who was a professional diplomat. Um, now, when uh, Ambassador Quainton uh, came to the end of his term, I. I found this little note from a UPI story. According to US press accounts in the United States, Quainton is being replaced because he has not shown sufficient support for Reagan administration policies toward Nicaragua. And I found this in a book about Nicaragua. Tony Quainton was, this is a quote from a, another American ambassador. Tony Quainton was fired for telling the truth. He was fired for telling Kissinger exactly what he did not want to hear that we should listen to the Sandinistas and explore their intentions. Quainton advised the commission, that is the Kissinger Commission, that the Nicaraguan government was not a dogmatic Soviet puppet. The Sandinistas could be tough, nasty, unpleasant, but we could work with them. And we should take their olive branches seriously. When they let opponents out of jail, lifted censorship, pursued the Contadora peace process, we ought to encourage that. Kissinger had disliked Ortega personally and was in no mood for this kind of conciliatory talk from Quainton. He told Reagan and Schultz to get rid of Tony as soon as he got back. Uh, actually, Ambassador Quainton survived his execution a lot uh, better than his successor, uh, Ambassador Bergold. Uh, Burgold, uh, Burgold's career came to an end. Schultz did try to name him to another ambassadorial post, but uh, Jesse Helms didn't let that happen. Ambassador Quainton was a little bit more skillful and uh, maybe a little more talented and uh, had a greater uh, store of respect inside the State Department, went on to a quite a uh, sterling career in which he ended up as being the Secretary General of the Foreign Service, uh, one of the most important positions in our diplomatic corps. So, I would I just offer my own little opinion. So we heard why Ambassador Quainton was removed from office, because he had policy differences or he was perceived to have said things that Kissinger didn't like. But I want to, I want to suggest another reason. Uh, as I said, we had these two wonderful ambassadors, Quainton and his successor, Burgo. But in one way, they were quite different. Uh, both were very thoughtful, intellectual uh, diplomats. Uh, but uh, Harry Burgo was quite aloof. Very, many people never even met uh, Harry Burgo. Quainton was not like this. Uh, Tony Quainton spoke fluent Spanish. He was always out in the streets. He was meeting people. He was traveling. He took part in community functions. He acted in community plays uh, and uh, was a real figure, a popular person in Nicaragua, certainly one of the most popular Americans to have uh, taken on a position like this uh, in history. But there was one moment when uh, Ambassador Quainton's uh, desire to plunge himself into Nicaragua, I think might have got, uh, gone a little too far. And I think this might have been the real reason why uh, he fell into disfavor. One day, Ambassador Quainton decided, instead of getting one of the Marines to give him a shave and a haircut, he's going to go to a barber shop. Goes out into Managua, he steps in a barber shop, and everybody's very happy to see him, and he had his nice shave. And uh, of course, that uh, barber had his uh, knife on uh, Quainton's neck, 
And Tony liked to make fun of this and say, you know, actually, I, I survived. I had a Nicaraguan. He had his knife on my neck, but he actually didn't slit my throat at all and actually gave me quite a nice haircut. I don't think people in Washington got the joke. They didn't think this was funny. I think they saw something very deep in there, that with that story, with the fact that he would make light of that, he was essentially trying to humanize Nicaraguans. And that flew in the face of uh, American policy. So uh, both in his personal style and in his commitment to diplomacy, I think Tony Quainton represented not only what is the best in American diplomacy, but what's the best in the United States. And that's why it's such a thrill for me to be able to introduce him to you tonight. Well, thank you, Steve. That, um, there's nothing for me to say, actually. Between the two introductions have said about all there is to say about uh, Nicaragua 40 years ago. For me, it's been a trip down memory lane. Uh, I moved on from Nicaragua to the Middle East and then to a number of jobs in Washington and eventually to Peru uh, and didn't spend much time, have not spent much time since thinking about the legacy of the Nicaraguan Revolution and the time I, I spent. And so I'm very, when Steve invited me, I was a little reluctant uh, to say, did I have any reflections, any thoughts about uh, that I take away from those years in the Sandinista Revolution? And it's wonderful to see so many friends and adversaries, actually, people with whom I engaged in all sorts of different levels uh, at the time that I was there to be here tonight. But I think this is a, an important moment to, to reflect on the Sandinista Revolution and its legacy. For once again, the United States is trying to bring about regime change in Nicaragua. Once again, the target of our suspicion is Daniel Ortega. Once again, the desired American outcome is shrouded in ambiguity and uncertainty. Once again, the glass is half empty for some half full for others. So when Steve asked me, I, I was initially skeptical, because I'm not an expert on Nicaragua. Um, I wasn't an expert then. Um, I'm not now, 37 years later, an expert now. But I had two and a half event-filled years. You've heard a little bit about them while I was there. And on my departure, the Sandinista humor magazine, the Semana Comica, had a full-page cartoon of me being spanked by Ronald Reagan over Ronald Reagan's knee in the happy presence of Dr. Kissinger and Gene Kirkpatrick. Uh, there I was. It was. I was clearly not, for the Sandinistas, the poster boy for anything and not for the Reagan administration's policy. But it's ironic that the current administration once again, focused attention on Nicaragua and on the Sandinista Comandante, Daniel Ortega, who once again is president of Nicaragua and who once again is in the crosshairs of American, Central American policy. Nicaragua today is the junior member of the Troika of Tyranny, which John Bolton breathlessly proclaimed last year. And as in the 1980s, Nicaragua, Nicaragua is again linked with Cuba and with Russia in the eyes of the US government, only to be joined in recent months by the Bolivarian revolution of Cesar Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. In 19, 2019, as in 1992, we're faced with many of the same dilemmas. Is regime change a viable strategy for American foreign policy? How are we to assess the successes and the shortcomings of a regime which proclaims lofty ideals and yet often resorts to repressive practices? And how does the legacy of history constrain what we can do to create a better future for countries which proclaim themselves revolutionary, but end up impoverishing the citizens they claim to have saved? As Steve mentioned, I arrived in Managua on the 15th of March, 1982, the first day of the secret war against the Sandinistas. While I was in the air from, with my wife from Miami to Managua, Commandante Ortega declared a state of emergency to, because this, that morning, that very morning, a CIA-sponsored operation had led to the blowing up of the bridges 
connecting Honduras and Nicaragua. Needless to say, I had not been briefed on what was about to happen and was completely taken aback by that information and punting as diplomats learn to do, I explained that uh, I looked forward to discussing these difficult questions with Comandante Ortega. But it was all downhill from there. I had been briefed about President Reagan's finding on Nicaragua, which led to increasingly aggressive actions against the Sandinista government. And these measures were explained to me, and indeed to the Congress, as disincentives for further Sandinista support for the FMLN in El Salvador, and as a way to hold the government to its original pledge of a mixed economy, multi-party democracy, and a non-aligned foreign policy. And by the time I arrived, all of these commitments seemed to the White House to have been abandoned by the revolutionary junta in Managua. In fact, the president's advisors had a different agenda, regime change. But this was not immediately apparent either to me or I think to my bosses in the State Department. And as Steve Kinzer mentioned, I came on the backside of an initiative which Tom Enders had put forward in September of 1981 and I was given a revised version of that to present to the Sandinistas in the spring of 1982, although with the additional requirement that the Sandinistas return or live up to the democratic and pluralistic assurances which they gave to the world when the revolution triumphed in 1979. I was something of a neophyte when it came to revolution. Uh, as a graduate student at Oxford, I had explored and written a thesis on the unsuccessful French efforts to overthrow the Bolshevik Revolution. However, that remote academic experience was not known to my contemporaries either in Washington or Managua, and it did not occur to me that it might be relevant. The Soviets, however, decided that I was a committed cold warrior because of my previous position as coordinator of counterterrorism in the Carter administration. And they assumed that I was an experienced and committed regime changer, or so at least Pravda charged and many in the Sandinista movement believed. Nothing could have been further from the truth. I was a rather naive 48-year-old Foreign Service officer with extensive experience in the Indian subcontinent and virtually no knowledge of Latin American history, culture, or politics. I was an improbable choice, in fact to go to Nicaragua in 1982. But I think the administration saw that counterterrorism label as one which would if not frighten the Sandinistas, at least put them on warning that they were getting some kind of hard-nosed uh, neocon uh, who would push through uh, an agenda of regime change. American policy then, and in some ways now, oscillates between two competing strategies, negotiation and pressure. And as we all know, in Nicaragua, the latter ultimately won out. And at the same time, as we were organizing the counter-revolutionary Contra efforts, in, both in Honduras and in Costa Rica, we were presenting a rather prickly olive branch to the Sandinistas, offering to live with the revolution if it upheld its pluralist promises and halted the export of the revolution. And at the same time, we were urging the Contadora powers to continue their efforts for a region-wide negotiated settlement. We were ratcheting up pressure, eliminating Nicaragua's sugar quota, terminating its aid except to the private sector, and steadily increasing direct pressure by blowing up the oil pipeline into Managua's refinery, mining Nicaragua's ports, and developing an effective contra-fighting effort. It was against this background that my mission impossible played out. I thank Steve for giving me the title of my talk. I didn't know what I was going to talk about, but he said, well, you know what it is. It was a mission impossible. The United States, I think you all know, throughout that period was obsessed by the Cold War and its implications. The administration accepted the assumptions of the domino theory, which had led us so far astray in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. The administration was convinced that if the communists established a base in Central America, they would push relentlessly north towards Mexico, and south to the Panama Canal, and one day there would be communists in San Antonio. And of course, if that were to happen, American security would indeed be gravely threatened. But the administration also suffered from what 
from a malady which still infects our Latin American foreign policy, which I like to call backyard syndrome. Today, no one seriously thinks communism is on the march northward until even San Antonio might be at risk. But we still regard the Caribbean and Central America as our backyard, where certain behaviors are, by local governments are inadmissible. And the current administration's focus on the troika of tyranny, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua is evidence of that fact. And that approach, as I think many of you know, has been true at least since 1905, when Theodore Roosevelt announced the corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, asserting a right for the United States to intervene in the hemisphere, but really in the Caribbean basin, in cases of chronic wrongdoing to act as an international police power. Nicaragua lived that history from 1909, when the Marines first arrived, through right to the end of the Somoza regime. Diplomacy, it seems to me, is the art of managing ambiguity and complexity to achieve outcomes favorable to one's national interests. And ambiguity, there was a plenty in the early 1980s in Nicaragua. At the heart of that ambiguity was not only the young Daniel Ortega, one of the ruling triumvirate and the nominal head of state, who came from a bourgeois family and was educated by Catholics, but it was also Tomas Borges, the seasoned revolutionary and founder of the FSLN. Hundreds of visitors came to see him. From the United States, they included senators and congressmen, business leaders, missionaries, concerned citizens. And all were fascinated by this rotund, small, cigar-smoking minister of the interior. All had heard of his ruthless suppression of enemies and his reliance on Cuban and East German apparatchiks. But few, however, were prepared for his personal charm or his official office decorated with a wall of crucifixes or saw his inner office, where besides the drinks trolley and the bottles of Shiva's regal scotch were two books, the Bible and the fundamentals of Marxism-Leninism. Indeed, the whole question of the relationship between religion and the revolution was one which bedeviled the administration's efforts right from the start in its efforts to roll back communist advances in Central America. Hardly a week went by during my tenure without the visit of a delegation of American religious leaders, lay, laymen and women, priests and nuns, pastors and rabbis, even the occasional bishop. And most believed that the revolution had done some good by overturning past oppressive social and political structures by educating the masses through the literacy campaign, and by extending the benefits of health care to marginalized villagers and urban dwellers. One such delegation arrived in the first week of my stay. And after I tried to explain the objectives of President Reagan's policies, they, they asked me if they could pray. Well, I was a neophyte at office praying. Uh, and I had never done it. And with a little, little hesitation, I agreed. There I was, alone in my office, a week into my tenure in Managua, with a deeply religious peace delegation holding hands and solemnly praying that the Reagan administration would see the errors of its ways. I stopped praying in my office. <laughs> and nobody asked again. But most groups, uh, and this testifies to the ambiguities that I lived through, in this Mission Impossible were polite and respectful. They listened to my presentation, even when they disagreed. But a member of one such group from the film industry in Hollywood angrily told his companions, he stood up in my presence, and said if there were ever to be Nuremberg trials again after the current war was over, the American ambassador would surely be one of the guilty. That's heavy duty stuff for an American ambassador. You remember those who were convicted in Nuremberg hung for their sins. So a mission which was difficult enough at the political and diplomatic level became even more difficult at the emotional and moral level. <coughs> Needless to say, one does not like to be denounced as a war criminal. And my staff hated the moral intensity of both the supporters and the opponents of the regime, even when they shared some of the criticisms of American policy or the criticisms of the Sandinista regime. 
it was mission impossible for the American ambassador. I think it was also mission impossible for the Catholic Church. There were several priests, as you may remember, in high positions in the government, including the foreign minister, Miguel Lascoto, and the two Cardinal brothers in the culture and education ministries. And liberation theology was very much in vogue in the United States and throughout Latin America. And the writings of the Peruvian priest, Gustavo Gutierrez, were much admired. However, there were also many Catholics who saw the revolutionaries as deeply hostile to the church and to its doctrines. And these views were reinforced by the bizarre incident, which some of you may remember, when Archbishop Obando's secretary, Father Bismarck Carballo, was photographed by Sandinista television fleeing naked from the home of a woman parishioner after an, after an alleged romantic tryst. You can't imagine how easy it is to shock Nicaraguans by putting a priest on television naked. It really does wake people up. And of course, we all remember the tragic, I think, visit of the Pope who was shouted down at the papal mass in Managua. What's interesting is the papal nuncio then, as now, finds himself, found himself, as the nuncio today finds himself, in a key mediating position, trying to bridge the wide gap between Christians in and outside the revolution. I remember my first week in uh, Nicaragua, formed so many impressions, was Holy Week, and I went to church, I'm a Roman Catholic, I went to church in Santo Domingo, which was then uh, Archbishop Obambo, he's not yet Obando, he's not yet Cardinal, parish church. And I'd been warned not to go there by some people at the bishop's conference here, because it would be a strong political signal, but I didn't believe, I didn't take advice well. And I show up at Holy Thursday Mass, and I receive communion, and there are television cameras, and a large number, large number, it seemed to me a large number, of what I thought of quite elderly, middle-class Nicaraguan ladies kiss me. And they say, ah, Senora Mador, we have the ambassador we've always dreamed of having. And I say, why? Because you're here. So I never went back there either. <laughs> well, I obviously had good relations with, with uh, Obando Bravo. But there was, it was hard to find a place in Managua where you could worship, where the priest was not in the revolution or against the revolution. Everything was divided. And this constant ambiguity spilled over into the daily life of all my colleagues, but certainly into the life of the uh, American ambassador. Against this background, getting the story right was one of the central responsibilities of the embassy. We believed, I believe to this day, that Washington cannot possibly get its policy right without accurate and informed analysis of the situation on the ground. And this was a particular challenge for Embassy Managua. To those in Washington and beyond who were suspicious of the Sandinistas, our reporting was often thought to be biased. At one point, B'nai B'rith, the Anti-Defamation League, you may be familiar with it, went to the New York Times to complain that the embassy had not reported on systematic anti-Semitism in Sandinista Nicaragua. The story appeared on the front page of the Times, and the department immediately became concerned that perhaps we actually had covered up a serious problem. We carried out an immediate investigation and concluded that the Sandinistas were anti-Zionist. They did not recognize the state of Israel, but, and it allowed the Palestinians to open an office. But no one we could find, not in the revolution and not against the revolution. E even the most rabid opponents of the Sandinistas believed that there ever had been any anti-Semitism in Nicaragua. Lots of things you could accuse the regime of doing, but not that. I regret to say that uh, that report, reaching that conclusion, was also not believed, and Elliot Abrams, now our special envoy for Venezuela, the wheel does keep coming round again, uh, descended on the embassy to check for himself whether the embassy's reporting and analysis was correct. And so he instructed me that I was to find a Jew, or Jews, that he could meet with to find out whether the Sandinistas were oppressing the Jewish community. We didn't know any Jews, <laughs> but we found one. His name was Jaime Levy. And whether you've ever met Jaime Levy, he was a very nice man. 
and he had breakfast with me and uh, Secretary Abrams. And uh, after we'd had our papaya juice and gotten down to serious business, Abrams looked at him and said, now, Mr. Levy, tell me about anti-Semitism in Nicaragua. Levy said, no, Mr. Secretary, there's no anti-Semitism in Nicaragua. And Abrams looks at him again and says, you can tell the truth even if the ambassador's here. <laughs> so I felt really warm and fuzzy about this. And Levy said, no, no, Mr. Secretary, let me tell you a story. I import maiden form bras from Guatemala. I hold them off the market for 90 days. I make lots of money, and the Sandinistas don't care. <laughs> well, Abrams thought he'd been set up by some kind of this dumb embassy, thought to get away with this. Somebody who, token Jew, who imported maiden form bras. So my reputation was always on the line. <laughs> and subsequently, I was summoned to the White House, where a senior official uh, complained to me that we were reporting too much good news from Managua. This is actually the much more serious point. And she urged me to help the president defend his policies. And she asked, was I the president's representative? And of course, I said, yes, ma'am. And did I want the president to succeed in Nicaragua? But, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, she said, that that was the case. I should increase my reporting of bad news because that would help the president defend his policies before the Congress. And I replied that we would report all the news, both good and bad, but that we would not skew our reporting one way or the other. Needless to say, that didn't satisfy the White House. The truth is, we did assiduously report on Sandinista violations of human rights, on their attacks on press and political freedoms, on their harassment of certain parts of the private sector, and on their generally intolerant attitude to opposition political parties. But we also tried to report faithfully on those aspects of Sandinista policy that seemed to be offering positive benefits to the people of Nicaragua. The literacy campaign, the health reforms, the barrio-led level self-government. And for those who believed that nothing good could come out of the revolution, these reports were seen as fuzzy-headed and misguided attempts by a young ambassador to undermine the Reagan administration's strategy in Central America. It was virtually impossible in that atmosphere to get the story right. The mission's reporting was scrutinized for signs of feeble-minded sympathy with the revolution and a lack of enthusiasm for US policy. My public appearances were scrutinized for signs that I had or had not walked out when public speeches condemned the United States and its support for the Contras. Critics wondered whether I did or I didn't stand when the Sandinista hymn was played and the crowd solemnly referred to the Yankee enemy of mankind. And some wondered why I did not protest the endless series of cartoons in El Nuevo Diario, in Barricada, La Semana Comica, de depicting me as a dim-witted accomplice for the CIA's violations of international law and Nicaragua's territorial and sovereignty. <coughs> Mission impossible. Indeed it was. It was, of course, equally difficult to satisfy the critics of the administration's policy. They saw our sanctions as impoverishing the Nicaraguan people and our support for the Contras and their incursions and attacks as violations of international law. They could not understand why we did not recognize the youthful and idealistic enthusiasm of the Sandinistas for what it was in their eyes, well-intentioned, idealistic, morally powerful. They saw us as blinded by anti-communist prejudice. And as a result, week by week, they came and called on me, and they protested, and they held demonstrations outside the embassy to denounce US policy. They organized candlelight vigils on the border calling for peace. The impossibility of the embassy's position, or rather my position, but it was much the same, became apparent when the Kissinger Commission arrived in Managua in October of 1983 charged by the president with recommending policies for resolving the Central American crisis, the commission contained some of the biggest names in American politics, including Lane Kirkland, the president of the AFL-CIO, and Henry Cisneros, then the mayor of San Antonio, and Senators Domenici and Benson, and Congressman Barnes and Kemp, plus academics such as Gene Kirkpatrick and Carlos Diaz Alejandro. It was a pretty good cross-section of American political thought, 
skewed to the right, but nonetheless not monolithic. And the day of the commission spent in Managua was a visit fraught with challenges which exposed the many ambiguities of the situation. My own presentation to the commission on that morning argued that a negotiated deal with the Sandinista regime might be achieved, at least with respect to its direct support of the revolutionaries in Salvador and maintenance of a relatively open society and our acceptance of the Sandinista regime itself. The commission was in no mood to hear that message. John Silver, the president of Boston University, pointedly challenged me to explain how my views were consistent with those of the White House. The commission was more impressed by Enrique Bolaños' presentation on the abuses of the Sandinista regime and his handing round of the first day cover of a recent Nicaraguan postage stamp commemorating the 100th anniversary of the death of Karl Marx. That, for the commission, was proof enough that the communists were in control. And I regret to say I did not have the wit to point out that the Sandinistas had also issued a series of George Washington stamps only a few months before. Ambiguity at every level. But the commission had made up its mind before it arrived. They were sure that they were up against a Marxist-Leninist regime in the process of consolidating itself into a state on the Soviet-Cuban model. The Commission's experiences, particularly the brilliantly detailed intelligence briefing, briefing by the head of Sandinista intelligence, confirmed their view of Cuban penetration and control. For history, that view became uh, widely held through the voice of Oliver North, famous for other things. He was the advisor to the Commission, and he saw this rather brilliant presentation we given by the Sandinista intelligence of where the Contras were and how they were coming down, it was good stuff. And he said, the commission, you've seen it now. You've seen the Cuban control. <laughs> you know, and they all nodded. They all nodded. Fact is, I have no doubt, I had no doubt then that the Sandinista regime had deeply penetrated the Contra movement and had a pretty good idea what they were doing and why. But if you wanted to find the Cubans under the rug, they were always there. And sometimes they were there, of course. I mean, that, um, their final meeting with Daniel Ortega was a disaster. Following a, an equally unsatisfactory meeting with Foreign Minister Descoto, where Senator Domenici accused Descoto of lying, and the, the, the minister accused Domenici of lying, uh, and they shouted at each other in, in a very unhappy way before going to see Comandante Ortega. Unfortunately, nothing happened that was good out of that meeting. Ortega lectured the commission for 40 minutes on the tragic history of American policy over the previous 125 years, from William Walker's takeover in the 1850s through the Marines' arrival in 1909, and in 1912 and beyond, and the death of Sandino and the support of, you, you all know the history. Every Nicaraguan knows the history. And the commission didn't know the history and didn't want to hear it. Uh, the commission just was in no mood to be lectured about the evils of the past. They simply walked out with no dialogue having taken place. Indeed, the whole thing was spoiled when the Sandinistas provided rather dry uh, tomato and cheese sandwiches and Coca-Cola to the commission at lunch. Well, you may say, how dumb. But in fact, I had been asked by the foreign ministry, maybe by Minister Tintinoco, to say what they would like to host a luncheon in honor of the commission, a formal luncheon. And I go and see Kissinger before he comes, and he says, no formal lunches, just sandwiches and Coke. So I tell the foreign ministry, sandwiches and Coke, and they say, gee, that's too bad. We really would like to do the correct thing. These were important Americans. So we had sandwiches and Coke, and the commission interpreted for what it was a, a deliberate slight by the Sandinista regime here. That was the day-to-day -day reality which um, I lived through. Re but however, let me say, reading the report of that commission 35 years later, and I hadn't looked at it, I was struck by the sophisticated and nuanced understanding of the underlying social and economic issues that Central American countries confronted. Were it not for its preoccupation with the Cold War dimension of the crisis, the report was remarkably balanced. To be sure, it stressed the threats to regional stability from a Marxist 
Sandinista regime and its Cuban and Russian backers. But it also went to great lengths to stress the need for a major long-term economic commitment by the United States to the region. It deplored past US associations with regimes such as that of Somoza and recognized that if the United States really wanted stability, it would have to be a major supplier of economic and commercial assistance with a minimum five-year time horizon. Had those themes been picked up and sustained aid to Central America been agreed to, some of the problems we are encountering now might have avoided or at least been ameliorated. Unfortunately, when the Sandinistas were eventually voted out of power in 1990, the United States largely lost interest in the region. We are reaping the whirlwind of that neglect in the refugee and gang crises we are facing today. There's not much use in crying over spilt milk. Opportunities to create a more stable Central America existed four <coughs> decades ago, and they were lost. Both sides could not see beyond their ideologies. Neither could escape from its history. The Sandinistas believed that they were a vanguard party and that history had entrusted them a revolutionary mission. We saw that mission as a fundamental rejection of and threat to our Western liberal values. They could not escape from the troubled history of Yankee intervention. We could not escape from Vietnam and the experiences of the Cold War. Bridging the historical, ideological, emotional divide between us was more than I or my colleagues could do. Try as we would, the mission was always impossible. Thank you. Oh, sure. Um, I have to just add, since uh, you heard so much about the Kissinger visit, that uh, of course those of us on the outside didn't know what happened inside the room that we saw the cartoon of the ambassador being spanked. Um, but we did hear a couple of great lines from Kissinger, who I think was only there for, I don't even know if he stayed overnight. He did not. He did not. He did not. So one day in and out, God forbid, would be almost as bad as going to a barber shop. Uh, so as Kissinger was being driven in from the airport into the center of Managua, and this story will resonate with any of you that have been to Managua, for the rest of you, I won't even bother to explain. But Kissinger looked out the window at what's going by on that road from the airport into Managua, and he said, he turns to one of the people in the car and said, it looks like the set for a movie about the aftermath of World War III. <laughs> <laughs> the de earthquake devastation had, had never really been clear. And then on the way out, on that same road, they had one other stop. They stopped at La Prensa, which we have built up as the great uh, defender of uh, liberties in, in Nicaragua. And the editors of La Prensa were very happy to show Kissinger uh, a sign of an attack. Some, somebody had fired a mortar round into the corner of the La Prensa building and knocked off a, several bricks in a little corner of the building. So uh, Kissinger was shown this as an example of what the Sandinistas do to a free newspaper. And his response was, how I wish I could have fired a mortar at the Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a few good lines, too. Uh, the ambassador has graciously agreed to take a few questions uh, before dinner. Uh, would anyone like to uh, engage or ask something, uh, try to Go back over history. Armstrong, please introduce yourself for the guests who may not know who you are. Yes, uh, it's Ambassador Quinton. My name is Armstrong Wiggins. I'm a Mosquito Indian from the Atlantic coast of yes. Nicaragua. I'm sure you heard my name. Yes, indeed. And um, my question is, you didn't mention anything about that struggle, that human rights situation. What can you say when you was there about the Mosquito side of it? Because the revolution was black and white, left and right. Marxism and Leninism versus the capitalism. But Indian issue was different. It actually it was, was. It was. It was different till I struggled in Washington to change Senator Kennedy and other mind that this is a different situation. It's not black and white. There's a nation. There's a people that is not part of this. And they're not included. It's been excluded. So what, what was your reaction? when you was the ambassador there? We reported a fair, because we had contact with representatives of the, uh, the Mosquito Indians. It was one part of the country to which we couldn't travel. I never went to Puerto Cabezas. Uh, none of my staff could go there, so we could get no first hand. We relied on people coming 
to Managua to tell us the problems that were being faced as the mosquitoes were caught between these warring elements here. I think we reported pretty fairly about the problems that the indigenous population was facing, but uh, it was only one of many things that we concentrated on reporting, but we certainly did report on it. Go ahead, Richard. Richard Feinberg, thanks for a really uh, a, a wonderful uh, presentation, Tony. Uh, you report on Daniel Ortega's harangue to the commission. I imagine that's the same harangue he has continued to give throughout his life. It's the same harangue he gave uh, when he first had, a, had an exchange with Barack Obama, even at the, uh, at the uh, Trinidad and Tobago uh, Summit of the Americas, when Hillary Clinton was asked about the, his remarks. Well, they were very long. <laughs> so my question is, um, how do you interpret uh, a presentation of that sort? Uh, the charitable interpretation might be he's actually not speaking to the Americans, but he's speaking to his team, and he's trying to reassure them that he's tough with the Americans. Uh, or, is there, or is there another interpretation that, that, this is, that he's a very limited guy who doesn't really know how to engage in diplomacy? Uh, doesn't know how to reach out to an audience uh, that would not receive well, uh, you know, this sort of, uh, what, did, what did it tell you about, about Daniel Ortega, who's been such a, an important figure throughout the last? Of course, it, it, he, he was, history did not uh, give it much of a welcome, may not even have shaken his hand. Um, I think, I, I guess I'm somewhere in between on this. Um, it does, Ambassador, can I ask you something? Do you use the microphone? It's before they record. Oh, sorry. Um, that almost any Nicaraguan in the revolution could give you the same spiel. That is, it was part of the standard presentation that America had consistently violated the sovereignty of Nicaragua. And these series, half dozen events, salient events, were known to every Nicaraguan, and everybody in the revolution went out of their way to tell Americans that they, or, Ortega began his talk. Actually, I thought, I, if I allow him to have a finest moment, before he started the harangue, he looked at Kissinger, and he said, you know, Dr. Kissinger, if your country had cared about democracy over the last 25 years in Nicaragua, you wouldn't have us. But there we are. And then he launches into it. And I think, I think he believes what he says. Is he a good diplomat? No, not particularly. Because uh, the, the meetings he had tended to either be confrontational, you know, or they tend to be psychophantic. <laughs> People either said, I, we, we love what you're doing, or we can't stand what you're doing. It's the came the dichotomy was clear here. Um, I, I, I wonder, since I, I'm not involved in any way, that he must look a little bit as I did a, a few minutes ago, back and he said, I've seen all this before. This, this is the same old America, the same old regime change. I've been telling this story, and it's still true, uh, from his perspective. That is, he makes no allowances for what has transpired under his regime, any more than I think the, at, at that, that point, the Sandinista leadership was prepared to acknowledge very many defects in their own behavior. Uh, there was a sense that we were doing history's work. And history had been bad to Nicaragua. And we're going to set it right. And I think, I, I wouldn't just dismiss this as sort of a, an ignorant man's ravings. I think um, that theme was heard all over the place in Nicaragua. And it's a tragic history in a sense, you know, which we have to live with as they do. Yes. I, um, I'm Alejandro Medaña from in that meeting at the, not the foreign minister while you were there. Can you speak in the microphone so this can be recorded? It's very okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Now I don't want to talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, Alejandro Eldana, and I was a senior foreign ministry official in your time. So, I'll just say a, an element about the meeting, and then I'll ask you yeah. the question. But I, I was there. And yes, it was startling 
uh, for Ortega and others to actually say, we, this revolution, is the product of a bad American policy um, on account of what had transpired over the Somoza, Somoza regime. The other part of that story is that once that meeting took place, that encounter, I slipped out and went into where the U.S. delegation was and sat down for a few minutes with Henry Cisneros, oh, yes. who had a bad cold. He was not well. Huh? Yeah, and, and Kissinger gave a very cold, hard look. But the conversation there was that this goes to incident, that was just a disaster because there was, as you just said, no communication. What can we do about that? Because our feeling was that the commission already had its mind made up before it ever left Washington. It was there to ratify something. So no surprises. There could have been no breakthrough at a public meeting, but had it not been, it could have been, it might have been different in another setting. But I want to ask you the, the same question once asked you 1983, the same one. Why couldn't the United States have coexisted with a little Yugoslavia in Central America? We could have. We could have. But we believed in what I suggested was the contagion effect that a little Yugoslavia we, we were so worried about what was going on elsewhere in the region that that little Yugoslavia, that Marxist authoritarian state, would be an example to others that they would follow. And we thought that was likely. I mean, we did, really did believe, I think, in the contagion of, uh, of ideology. Uh, and so it made very hard then, if you couldn't stamp it out, to allow it to exist. I never, I never believed that, as, as you heard. I thought we could have lived with a Sandinista government under some circumstances, with certain kinds of assurances. Uh, we might have been able to live with some of the ideas that the Contadora group put forward, although those of you who remember the Contadora problem, the, the Contadora countries, led by the Mexicans and others, wanted to reduce the number of American troops in Central America, condition of getting Cuban and Russian troops out of Nicaragua, and that never was a starter in Washington. That the, the, the equivalency, we never accepted any equivalency between them and us. I think it was inevitable. We're big, they're small, uh, and this was our backyard. Hello, my name is Patsy Lewis. I just want to know if there were any discussions about Grenada, because the Grenada Revolution was existing the same time, and you know your own personal reflections of how Grenada might have entered the picture then. Well, actually, I have a story actually about Grenada, about Nicaragua and Grenada. The, you may remember that uh, we intervened in order to protect the students at the medical school. I mean, that was the pretext for the intervention that they were being held hostage and that the United States was going to liberate, and did liberate them. So it was a week later, and Comandante Borje calls me in, and he said, Mr. Ambassador, we've been following what's going on in Grenada. And I just want to tell you, we're not going to give you any pretext ever to intervene. We're not going to take any hostages. And I have already ordered, this typical Borje, 20 buses to be set aside to take your people to the airport anytime they want to leave. <laughs> so they took notice. I mean, they did see that the Americans were capable of intervening, and the Grenada example was one that they worried about. Much of the rationale you may remember about the New Jewel Party sounded like the rationale for policies against the Sandinistas and so forth. So yes, it did have an impact. But we never used the buses. I still remember meeting uh, Maurice Bishop in Monaco. He okay. came for the anniversary, second or third anniversary, and uh, he made such an impression that Daniel Ortega actually names one of his sons Maurice, after Maurice Bishop. Stephen, one more. 
Yes, hi, my name is Don Ross. I want to thank you for your very interesting presentation and insight there. Well, I'm concerned about history and, and having your knowledge shared to correct the record that is so pervasively wrong so often. Specifically, it appealed to me was the Coke bottles and the drinks and what was really happening for lunch. And it wasn't, there was a slight there, but was that ever corrected? Is there any way some of this history, is the Watson Institute, if you're taping this stuff, going to get it out in the public? So we have all this fake news, so we have some real news that needs to overcome some of the fake news that was happening back under Kissinger. Well, you know, I guess I'm, I'm in the business of I'm in, in making an effort to try to write up many of these things. Most of these stories can't be co corrected. Uh, I think I mentioned to several of the members of the commission that uh, the lunch was as the chairman had asked for it, but they, they, they couldn't believe that the Sandinistas would give them such crummy food. <laughs> and it's, it's little things like that, actually, that change the emotional climate. It didn't change the facts. And then, as the several said, they had made up their mind, I think, about the basic outlines here. But little things turn, people say, boy, were we badly treated. You know, these sons of bitches. I, excuse my language. You know, is that the kind of approach, you, you know? And I think that's why diplomacy actually does make a difference on the, on the margins of thinking about how you create the context within which other people can work to solve their problems. And we were never successful in doing that. We had special envoys kept coming down. There were all sorts of efforts, in fact, to promote a dialogue beginning with Enders in September of 81. But it never, we never could get over the, uh, the, the built-in uh, suspicions that we were encountering on the Sandinista side and that I encountered on the, White, on the side of the White House. It was hard. Mission impossible. Well, uh, what a wonderful way to start if we can maintain this level of sophistication and insight. I think we're all in for a great weekend. Thank you so much.